So we've done universal instantiation, we've done universal generalization. Um, the next is existential generalization, uh, and I'm going to talk about that now. All right. Uh, all right, number three is existential generalization. That's number three. Existential generalization, and uh, let's see what we're given. On line one, we're given for all x, if x is an A, then x is a B. On line two, we're given um, for some x, or there is at least one x, same thing. And I actually don't think I'm going to have enough room for this. Um, there's at least one x, or for some x, if x is an A and x is a D, and our conclusion that we're trying to attain, our conclusion is that, um, and I'll actually write the conclusion on, mm, no, I can squeeze it. The conclusion is, uh, for some x, uh, bx and dx, squeeze it in here, if, if b, I'm like running out of room, I hope that's visible, right, that's, I have to sort of cram it, but, um, there's at least one x, or for some x, x is an a and x is a d, the conclusion there's at least one x, or for some x, x is a b and x is a d. Alright, so I'm given this as my premises, and that's the premises in total, and we have to draw our conclusion, this. Um, for some x, x is a b and x is a d, right? And again, what this stands for is not important to me at all. You can figure out some words or some terms that you want to throw in there. I'm more interested, I'm only interested and sort of the symbolization uh, uh, of this. There is a rule that needs to be applied here, right? And it's, it's an essential rule um, in the use of existential generalization. And just commit it to memory. I'm not going to go through um, sort of the rationale behind the proof. Anytime we're doing um, existential generalization on a line, let's say we have line 1 and we have line, uh, you know, line uh, n. Right? So we're trying, to, we're trying to prove, you know, we're going through our proof of validity and deducing our conclusion. Um, you can never, in the use of existential generalization on a previous line, have uh, a universal instantiation, right? You, can never, you can't have a universal instantiation and then arrive at um, an existential instantiation, right? <clears throat> you can't do that. You can't have a universal instantiation on one line, previous line, and then arrive at an existential instantiation. This would always, always be wrong, right? This would be wrong. It has to be the case that on any previous line, on any previous line, you have your existential instantiation first, and then we arrive at our universal instantiation, right? You don't do, it's just committed to memory, you don't universally instantiate before your existential instantiation. You always existentially instantiate first, then use your universal instantiation. There's a whole bunch of you know, rationale as to why this is the case. Uh, I'm not going to get into it now. Copy um, gives an example, I think, if I remember correctly, in the book of constructing an argument like, um, I forget how it goes with the dogs and cats, but all, all cats are mammals, all dogs are mammals. Uh, therefore a cat is a dog or something like that. You can't, you know, there's, there's logic, there's, there's a, a rationale um, in it. I'm not going to get into it now, just commit it to memory. We are always going to existentially instantiate on a previous line of the proof before we universally uh, uh, instantiate. Okay, let's begin. So, uh, line three. So since we know that, on line three we can't 
put our universal generalization first, right? You don't want to uni universally generalize first. What we want to do is, uh, not generalize, universally instantiate first. What we want to do is we want to existentially instantiate. So what do we get? Well, in the instantiation, we're going to get a y, this is very basic, a y and d y, right? a y and d y on line two, and what I did was existentially, uh, line two, I use existential instantiation, right? I've instantiated, we know that this is the universal game because it's represented by x, I've instantiated no truth function here, truth function here, no truth function here, soon to be truth function on another line, right? So I've instantiated the existential claim, and I've justified it by existential instantiation on line two. Okay, now we can instantiate our universal claim, like we've been doing before, right? So our universal claim now is going to be a, if y is uh, an a, then uh, y is a b. And this is going to be on line one, universal instantiation, right? We've taken the universal claim, instantiated it. We've taken the existential claim and instantiated it. However, we've instantiated the existential claim before we've instantiated the universal claim, uh, following the rule. You have to instantiate the existential before the, before the uh, universal claim. Okay. Well, that, that seems pretty simple. Now, what are we trying to get to? We want to get to bx and dx, right? We want to get to um, bx and dx. Well, how do we go about doing that? Well, let's see what we can do. We recognize that if we could get d by itself on a line, then that would be good. And how do we go about getting b on a line by itself? Well, what I, and there's many ways you can go about solving this, but it doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm just trying to have you have an understanding of sort of my rationale into this. My, my, the way that I always solve, uh, approach these problems is what is it that I'm trying to get in my conclusion? What do I want my conclusion to be? Right? The more complex your, your, uh, your problems become is the more difficult it is to find the line of reasoning, the line of validity, rather, to that conclusion. So, for example, in, just a quick aside, for example, in the, um, my attempt, my ongoing attempt, and actually many uh, YouTube viewers have been helping me with this, to um, demonstrate the validity of the unknown known, first it's hard enough just to symbolize it. But once you've symbol, so the first step is to try and symbolize it. The second step is after you've symbolized it, trying to prove that it's a valid, it's a valid um, argument by you know deducing um, the conclusion. It's it's not an easy thing at all. What you want to do, however, this is far more easy because you've been given the conclusion. So you recognize if I have this on the line and I have this on the line, my, my, my conclusion is basically done. How do I get dx if x is a d, uh, not if, x is a d, how do I get that on the line? Well, what we can do is we can use a rule, right? Uh, and there's a rule for this, and again, I have the rules up. Just click the banner or the link, and it'll take you to the, the rules that I'll type up, and, and you'll be able to use it. Um, I just need, I need to get d by itself, right? So what I do is I flip this order, right? So that it, I would have dy and a y, right? And the rule that allows me to flip conjuncts is called commutation, right? So it's line three, um, and it's com. The more you do this, the more you'll understand. And all I'm doing is I'm flipping um, line, uh, I'm, I'm flipping dy and a y. I've flipped it so that I have uh, dy on this side, a y on that side. The reason is because in the rule of the next rule that I'm going to use, line. Six, I can get dy by itself, which is what I need, right? I can get dy itself. And how did I get dy? Well, I use simplification on line five. So five, simp. Right? I've used simpli simplification on line five, right? If I have, if I have um, p and I have q, right? I can simplify and get this by itself, right? I can simplify the claim and get it by itself. So simplification on line uh, five. So now I have dy. Now all I need to do is get this b free, right? And the question is, well, how do I get that b free? Well, you see that here's b, right? And we see that I have a in a line. So um, you should be thinking about, at this point, I want to get this b, but 
in order to get this B, it would be better for me to get this A on its own line, right? So why not get that A on its own line, right? So um, we have dy, dy and ay, and here we see that we have the inverse, right? Ay and dy. So I can get the A by itself, just like I got the D by itself, right? And in this, what I'm going to do is I'll say, well, let's get this Ay by itself. It's in the proper location, so I can use simplification on this as well. So we can get Ay, and it's line, what is that, 3? Simplification. All right, so now I have line 3, simplification. So I have Dy by itself, which is part of the conclusion. I have Ay by itself, and the question is, well, why is Ay valid? Why, uh, not valid, but why is a, Ay up? Uh, and I, I should be talking formally, why is uh, y is an a, why is y is an a important, right, why is it useful? Well, because I see that in using, and freeing this up, I can now get my by, right, which is what I need. And how do I do that? Well, you see it, right, the form, the form is if p, then q, if I jump, I will fall, if I jump, I will fall, I jump, if I jump, I jump, if I jump, I will fall, I jump, therefore I fall, right? So I can get by now, right? If p, then q, p, therefore q. If p, then q, p, therefore q. So I can get by now from line 4 and line 7. Yeah, line 7, I've used modus ponens, right? If p, then q, p, therefore q. So now I get by on line 8, and I'm justified there. Now what we see is, well, this is, this is good now, right? We have everything we need. It's time to sort of tidy up the solution. Um, I want to have bx and dx. So on line 9, where's our b isolated? Well, our b is isolated on line 8. So I can have by and, right, I can have by and uh, dy, which is 6, dy, and the justification for this, right, for by and dy, very simple rule, is conjunction, and it's on line 8 and 6. And conjunction is C-O-N-J. Okay, so I have by, if y, uh, not if, um, y is a b and y is a d, right? y is a b and y is a b and y is a d. Um, so we have... On line 9, it has the form that we need, right? Here's B, here's B, here's D, here's D, here is the instantiation. All we need to do now is go back to the generalization, and that's the last line of the proof, right? Line 10, now we go back to the claim, right? Um, there's at least one X, or for some X, right? For some X, um, B, right? X, X is a B, and X is a D. And that's what we're trying to do, right? So there's at least one X, or for some X, X is a B, and X is a D, which is the conclusion we're trying to get to. We're able to get through that to that conclusion by following these steps. Uh, it was through the use of conjunction that we were able to attain this claim, and then from this claim we are able to existentially uh, generalize to the conclusion that we're trying to arrive at. So we know that this, um, this argument is valid and we've demonstrated the validity of, uh, we've demonstrated the validity of this, uh, this argument. Okay.